And then to kick things off, I'm gonna turn it over to, I'm Colin Keegan, VNRC's membership and engagement director, by the way. I'm handling some of the Zoom logistics on this call, uh, but to start the, uh, the topic, Backyard Habitats, I'll turn it over to VNRC's Forest and Wildlife Program Director, Jamie Fidel. Great, thanks, Colin. Thanks everybody for being here. This is a really exciting topic. Um, it's a topic that we often receive a lot of uh, inquiries from um, Vermont residents and our members, um, sort of asking, "What can I do to sort of manage and, and help uh, conserve my my backyard habitat for diverse species uh, in Vermont?" And so. Um, we recently helped sponsor an event with um, renowned conservationist Doug Talame that was hugely successful. There was a lot of interest and maybe some of you attended that. Um, so this webinar is really designed to, to be a resource for all of you and people who will be able to watch it in the future. Um, Vermont Natural Resources Council as an organization typically uh, focuses on statewide policy and also strategies to help towns and municipalities with their approaches to to wildlife conservation. We've worked on uh, supporting legislation that's been instrumental to help with wildlife conservation, uh, including uh, something that's referred to as Act 171, which, which uh, requires towns to identify important forest blocks and habitat connectors and plan to reduce the, the fragmentation of those areas. Um, we're really proud of all the work that's going on in municipalities across Vermont to engage in that. Um, but we're also mindful that a lot of conservation happens uh, right in your backyard and on the, on the properties that you own. And we really wanted to spend some dedicated time talking about the opportunities um, that lie in there. Um, and so um, we're gonna be really excited to field your questions. We've got uh, a number of, of, of experts here to kind of share their, their perspectives with you and then we'll open it up. Um, we do have, and I'll, I'll share with you a little bit later where you can find, this is our most recent publication, our Vermont Environmental Report on uh, a lot of topics on maintaining backyard habitat. So I'll show you where you can find that and, uh, and we're gonna help you with some other resources too uh, a little bit later. Uh, but this, to kick this off, I'm gonna first um, introduce uh, Steve Perrin, who's a, um, uh, just I'm thrilled that Steve can be here today. I've known Steve for, for decades. Uh, he's been a real friend to the Vermont uh, conservation community and to um, species in Vermont with his work. He recently retired from the Vermont Department after serving as the uh, manager of the Wildlife Diversity Program, which used to be formerly the non-game and natural heritage program. And he, he was there for 30 years. And so Steve leaves a lasting legacy uh, on behalf of uh, non-game uh, species. Uh, the program that he helped oversee is responsible for managing, monitoring and conserving non-game wildlife, native plants and natural communities. Uh, special focus is given to the protection of endangered and threatened species, including supporting the listing permitting and uh, implementation of recovery plans for those imperiled species. Um, and um, again, really happy that, that Steve is here and Steve really uh, looking forward to your presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and please fill in any other background that you think is, is relevant on, on who you are for everybody here, uh, take it away. Okay. Well, thanks, Jamie, that was a nice introduction. I, I won't say any more about myself I'm retired and happy about that. Um, they have some really good people working at the department who are carrying on the good work there. And like I was quoted in the, the report that Jamie showed everybody, it really, conservation really is a team sport. We need everybody in. And so I think the focus today on backyard habitat is part of that because most of us have pretty incredible backyards. And even if you have just a patio, or a balcony, you can still do stuff that helps wildlife. I do want to mention that some years ago, I wrote this booklet, um, Backyard Wildlife Habitat in Vermont. There's a link to it in the VER report that Jamie mentioned. Uh, the fi I find the easiest way to find it is just to do an online search for Vermont Backyard Habitat, and it should come up. Came up first on my search yesterday. so. I want to get right into some slides, and so we have time for Paul and 
Karina and your questions. So maybe gonna have to slide. So I've been fortunate. Part of my backyard includes a very large uh, stream and I've been monitoring wood turtles for decades. And behind me is, is that stream um, and water is incredibly important for wildlife. So I happen to be lucky I've got a natural source of water, but if you don't have a natural source, a pan of water is all you need. And this really came home to me one winter where I was watching goldfinches dropping into my, um, my gutter. I want to start all over again because I, I couldn't get this. There, that's better. And you know, just, just a tin pan would be enough. If you have a water feature in your garden with dripping water and stuff, that will actually draw animals in. But I find just a, a plant saucer is enough to really service the wildlife. It's for drinking, it's for uh, bathing. Um, a lot of animals, chipmunks, uh, my dog, uh, you know, the birds, they all use it. The other really important thing uh, I believe is, um, I'm gonna, is food. And food comes in many different varieties and different animals use different types of food. This year is a, I'm having a, a, a bonus uh, apple tree crop. And you might have noticed driving around Vermont, some of the trees okay. are so laden that they're actually breaking uh, the stems, the branches on the, So here's a wild plum. Uh, it's a native species in Vermont. Uh, it doesn't always fruit this year, it's fruiting. Um, black cherry, big tree. Uh, if you look up over 100 feet in the spring, you'll see bees, native bees buzzing around it. And uh, a lot of the food is up in the tops of the trees and the birds really go for the black cherry, wild grapes. Um, this is one of my favorite plants, silky dogwood. It's a native. It's really good for erosion control, grows along stream banks or in uh, old fields. Uh, I've used it as a foundation planting. It has these blueberries this time of year. Another good one is uh, gray stem dogwood or red panicled is the other name uh, for the red stems holding the berries. Just took a walk today. There's a lot of uh, berries on the ground, so the birds must be using it. I've had big flocks of robins on migration stop in and use this. And then a, an overlooked food species that I think is incredibly important is staghorn sumac. Nobody eats it this time of year, but come spring when all the food is exhausted, bluebirds, crows, pileated woodpeckers, flickers, all sorts of animals are using this because it's a survival food. It's maybe the only food available until like the insects come out in the early spring. So if you have a, a winter uh, that extends into spring, sometimes sumac is what makes a difference of the birds going in. And for bluebirds alone, I love it. And then sometimes the plants themselves are the food. So here's a monarch caterpillar feeding on native uh, milkweed. And then you can choose to feed uh, with bird feeders and, and different things. Uh, I do, uh, it takes some care and uh, there's debate about it. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Department urges people not to have feeders up except for December to March. Uh, that's only four months. Um, this is a picture in May. So I was cheating here and I've got, you know, oranges out for the Oriole. I picked up an indigo bunting. I've got some finches on one of the tube feeders and I try to provide a mix of different feeders. So a couple of blue jays don't hog all the food and just mix it up so the uh, smaller birds can get in there too. And you can see I have a, just a, a plant tray with water in it underneath it. So this kind of speaks to if you don't have a big yard, 
even a deck is enough. You have uh, deck plantings. You can see in the far wall of my house, I've got a nectar feeder for hummingbirds. My wife's big into perennial gardening annuals in perennials. Always have a hummingbird, you know, and they're still here. It looks like the youngsters that I haven't seen a male for a while. They're on the deck every single day. They'll go up to the nectar feeder if they haven't got a lot of nectar coming on that particular day. They're going to the jewel weed and the wild plants also. So uh, between all the wild plants in my wife's gardens, uh, it's really a haven for hummingbirds, moths, butterflies, other pollinators. And so here's a hummingbird moth down in the lower section of, of the screen. You actually are looking at some of the flowers through the wing. It's also called the clear winged sphinx moth. And here's a monarch uh, caterpillar that's feeding on a butterfly weed, which is a milkweed. Uh, we pie this plant specifically for the monarchs. So we're, we're all in on monarchs. And so uh, this caterpillar crawled off, created what we refer to as a J. It's about to uh, create a chrysalis. Looks like a little jewel that's underneath the railing on our deck. This is all this year. You wait a little while, pretty soon you see a butterfly inside the chrysalis. I mean, it's just magical. Uh, an animal struggles out and has to dry off his wing. And then, then you got a monarch and uh, they're just an incredible uh, insect. They're about to do their big migration down to Mexico. So it's five generations of monarchs moving up through the United States to Canada. And it's one generation that makes the long hop down to Mexico, this one little forested area where they overwinter. I think it's like 3,000 miles away. Just amazing. And then cover. So it, I've talked about food, water, and now cover. You really need those three components. Here's just a line of bird feeders in my field. There's a shelf nest. I have a robin that built three nests this year. I removed the nest after each uh, fledging of the young, uh, they had three successful nests, but it can just be a brush pile. So instead of hauling off brush, uh, if you have the space and neighbors who don't mind or enough space that the neighbors don't know, just pile up your brush. A lot of stuff will use it, salamanders because it's more moist underneath. I have rabbits that burrow in there, uh, chipmunks. So it's just, it's just kind of fun. And, by having the cover, the wildlife feels more secure. You're more likely to see them. And here's just a, this is my garden. My wife has all these beautiful perennials. I have a fern garden and I let a lot of uh, spring ephemerals come out. I have mostly ostrich fern, which I get a couple crops every year for uh, eating. Uh, but this tangle is full of rabbits and chipmunks. They use it to get around the house. Um, and now just moving from my patio around the backyard, you can see there's, there's the deck. I have a big quince bush on the corner. Other side of the quince bush, there's perennial gardens. There's never more than 20 feet. And you can see beaten trails from the chipmunks going across it. You know, they just feel secure enough traveling around my yard. You go a little further, you see more garden. I have another fern tangle going over to my vegetable garden, other side of my vegetable garden. I have some space, but none of it's so big that the animal's taking a big risk. And then my front yard's uh, kind of shady. Uh, they use the foundation plantings for cover. And, you know, oftentimes I'll be walking the dog and the rabbits and the chipmunks are actually between me and the house. And you can see a chipmunk scooting by. Um, and they're even tolerant of the dog on the leash. I mean, they're just kind of figured out that we're okay, we're not a threat. And so you get to see all kinds of stuff. And here, uh, it's, it's almost like a nursery. Underneath the bird feeder, I got a baby red squirrel, a baby rabbit, an adult chipmunk. Behind them is uh, stinging nettle, which you normally wouldn't probably want, but a lot of the larva caterpillars for some of what I, like uh, uh, butterflies, like the comma, the question mark, and some others, it's a food plant for the larva, the, for the caterpillar. So I try to always have a patch of nettle. 
I do have to put my plants in jail if they start getting hammered by the rabbits. Uh, so you can see over on the right hand side, I've, I've tried to cage in some plants that evidently were tastier than some of the others. But my, I don't really have a lawn in the traditional sense. If I can mow it high and it'll grow as part of my lawn. So I've got plantain and smart weed and, you know, there is some grass. There's also sedge and different things. So the, the rabbits are actually happy to be grazing in that as much as uh, anywhere else. In a little bit closer view, you can see the smart weed in the bottom right hand corner and gill over the ground. And, and, and because I have the small mammals and birds, I also have bigger mammals. And this, this is 20 feet from my front picture window. Uh, Bobcat was uh, checking things out after I took this picture. It went in the backyard and I actually watched it go inside the gazebo, probably because the, the rabbits and the chipmunks are underneath there and there's a lot of scent. And then a further away, this is maybe 300 feet from my house, gray fox. I have yet to see a gray fox in the 30 plus years I've lived at this location. I find their tracks every winter. They go right around the house because I have cover that kind of encircles the house. And this is just on a game camera. I actually had two foxes. And then you go a little further from my house back down to the stream and uh, we've got otters. This is a marking area for the otters. And uh, for as long as I lived here, I've had otters, uh, which is just really fun. So that's it for me. And I'll turn it back to you, Jamie. Stop my share. Great, thanks, Steve. That was wonderful and uh, inspiring. And um, again, just want to take this quick opportunity on behalf of, of VNRC and our members to thank you for the legacy that you've left in your professional capacity, working on behalf of uh, species in Vermont. And um, we're really fortunate that you've been uh, helping to lead on wildlife conservation issues in Vermont, and hopefully we'll continue to in other capacities and uh, really encourage people to check out the book that Steve that Steve mentioned. And again, we'll show you how you can find uh, the link to it. I believe in the chat also, um, Alex may have posted or, or Colin where you can, you can find Steve's book. So thanks, Steve. We'll get to some questions that folks have for you in a little bit. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Paul Leibel, um, thank you for being here. Um, Paul, we're going to turn this over to you to talk about your experience with wildlife habitat and forest management in Richmond. Uh, Paul is a retired healthcare professional who's resided in Richmond uh, for 40 years. He's a proud father of three and a grandfather of four who spends his spare time enjoying photography, gardening, woodworking, and sailing. He also took the picture of the bobcat that's on the cover of our Vermont Environmental Report. And again, we're going to tell you in a little bit how you can read that report if you haven't seen it. Um, and uh, Paul and, uh, and Brenda Leibel have certified their mix of open fields and wooded hillsides uh, in 2019. And uh, we're going to share some resources about that certification program uh, in a little bit. Paul, take it away. Well, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. I'm hoping everybody can hear. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, um, why don't I just jump into sharing my screen. Uh, as mentioned, the Certified Wildlife Habitat, we um, joined the National Wildlife Federation and the affiliate with the VNRC. Uh, and <clears throat> the thing I liked about it, um, was that it talked about food, water, cover, and places to raise the young. And it keeps a nice focus in mind um, uh, as, as you go about your backyard work. Okay, okay, great. So again, that focus, and like Steve, um, we have a lot of apple trees, we have a lot of crab apple trees, and they offer a lot of uh, wonderful food, particularly in the winter. Um, um, for the birds and especially the deer. If you look at the picture on the left, um, all those dropped apples are gone within a couple of days and they continue to drop and they continue to get eaten. And we've seen fox, a lot of deer um, as well. 
<clears throat> crab apples seem to be the bounty. <laughs> we have about four crab apple trees and um, the birds just love them. But we've seen raccoons up in them um, as well. And um, like Steve, we also feed birds. We try to keep it to winter. Um, we've had uh, the rose-breasted grosbeaks, cardinals, the typical blue jays. And if you look at the picture in the bottom right, there's a squirrel actually buried in there with the food in the squirrel feeder, and uh, which he's sharing with a, a blue jay. <clears throat> Again, birds make up a lot of the focus that we initially had after building gardens. And um, we were happy putting out a lot of blue jay uh, feeders and, um, you know, for the blue jays with a lot of corn. But we also started to put out nest boxes for, for the blue birds and had a nice return each year with um, blue birds and some of the other uh, Bohemian waxwings. There's a flicker that even came to the feeder, which is pretty unusual. Just a couple more pictures of birds we've seen flying. <clears throat> and we're fortunate to have good water sources on the property um, with uh, two ponds. One's a quarter acre pond, the other one's a little bit smaller and a third pond that's further up that's uh, fed by water coming off springs. And the nice thing is it brings in so much more diversity um, with ducks, geese, uh, an assortment of other mammals. The deer come down, you can see the fawn up there. We've had turtles, frogs are a big um, attraction. And <clears throat> two years ago, there were a pair of snapping turtles that were mating in the pond. And I thought for sure they were gonna kill each other at first, only to realize they were probably mating. Frogs, um, bullfrogs, leopard frogs, and assortment of others, they're an attraction for not only um, kids who wanna catch them and spend hours roaming around the pond, um, but various other folks that show up, like this river otter, who came in the, in the winter and um, would pop his head out after sliding down the slopes for a while, and would always then pop his head back out with a fish in his mouth. I mean, these things eat voraciously. And uh, I think the decline of trout in the ponds is probably largely in, uh, due to river otters coming through. We also have great blue herons that fly in. They love frogs as well and eat a lot of the fish. Um, most days those are dace or catfish. There is some trout still, but for the most part, the water has gotten a little warmer. And so it's changing over. Game cameras, I think are, are a big asset for anybody trying to see what's going on on the property. Um, we've seen bobcat. You get to see the behavior of deer as well, and probably a hunter's prize 12 pointer. Oops. Bluebird houses, um, they share with chickadees and indigo buntings and house wrens as well. Um, but again, I think they were largely responsible. We have about eight of them on the property. And I think the resurgence of bluebirds has largely been due to that. And we have open boxes as well. They're um, favored by robins and cardinals, as you can see, doves, house finches. Um, make them out of cedar. There's a bunch of um, uh, places that we've stored these under cover or out on fence posts. And um, we get a lot of nests being built there too. I'll have to rethink this arrangement. When I was taking this picture, I was actually looking um, to show you a rock wall where a lot of invasive plants had grown. And I started to realize when I came back and looked at the picture that this is compressed because of the focal length, but um, that bluebird house is, looks like it's pretty darn close to the barred owl 
house and uh, probably not a good arrangement for the bluebirds or any other birds in the area. We've not had a barred owl inhabit the house, but they say it takes a couple of years before that happens. And hopefully as time goes on, they'll inhabit um, the, the area. So we do get a lot of deer. I would say for, first and foremost, that's the animals we see the most. Second would be followed by turkeys. We see large groups of turkeys, um, the moms. This was this just this summer, and we had another uh, mother that had a pair of, of uh, fawns, and they're just wonderful to watch. They eat a lot too. <laughs> um, raccoons are prevalent. We see a lot of um, rabbits as well. And then less or so, we see uh, red fox. They're almost on a, a daily visitor on the game cameras, but they're less visible to us when we're out walking. Here's another picture of a red fox. He was right by the pond, um, just kind of circling the pond and uh, was almost curious of who we were and what we were doing there. With ponds come beaver. Um, beavers are wonderful, industrious little animals, but they're also a problem if you own a pond because they dam up and cut down everything around it. So we try to discourage them um, as much as we can with screenings as well as uh, just being visible and chasing them out when they do show up. The um, opossum, had, I hadn't seen an opossum here in years. And uh, this guy just kind of sauntered down through the backyard out of the woods and just took his time moseying around. I hear they're great for ticks. They're probably a great asset. Um, but again, don't see them as often. And of course, black bear. This guy took down the feeder, it had no food in it. This was just this past summer. Um, don't know why, there must've been remnants of some food, but he just, knocked this down and uh, I was standing probably 20 feet from him at this point. And I'm not really sure he saw me, um, but um, he, he eventually raised his nose and pointed straight at me and realized I was there. And I think it was the smell that he got to sense I was there. Uh, Mink, mink come through also. This guy popped up right around the rock. I think he was scurrying around looking for food. And uh, again, very, very comfortable being in the area. Wasn't concerned. He watched me carefully as I tried to get closer for a better picture, but um, was seen very relaxed and very comfortable. Um, a little history with this. My wife was in the kitchen, looked outside between a maple tree and the bird feeder. Uh, and this was late, I want to say April, uh, maybe beginning of, of May. And she thought it was a groundhog that had been visiting the area as well, eating some of the bulbs and stuff out of the garden. So immediately realized it was a bobcat. And he, I th think it fell asleep. I came out onto the deck and he was, he just literally did not move at all um, until I made a noise. And then he slowly lifted his head and just sat there looking at me. And we exchanged views probably for a good 10, 15 minutes. And I was always taking pictures. Um, as I took one step closer, we'll look at another picture of the bobcat here. Uh, one step closer was only needed. He took from this pose, he leapt up and over the rock ledge and off he went. Um, my thinking I was leaving the back door open and that I could run back in is totally ridiculous. This guy could have jumped easily to me um, after seeing that leap. <laughs> so invasive plants, um, one of the things we've been struggling with is invasive plants. And um, the two listed on top, glossy buckthorn and honeysuckle are the ones 
predominantly on our property and near us. We've also seen, you know, the poison parsnip and purple loosestrife, and then two self-inflicted uh, invasives, burning bush and bishop's weed. Um, this is a picture of the glossy buckthorn. Buckthorn, it's right on the edge of the road of our property. And I thought I had girdled this tree completely, but obviously had not because it's still fruiting this year. And that's unfortunate. I was hoping it would be gone. Uh, this is a closer look at the um, glossy buckthorn fruit. Um, apparently it's liked by birds, but I guess the it's still out for whether or not it's beneficial to them or not. They do eat them because we've seen evidence of that. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to another slide. I'll show you what the effect of that has been. The picture on the right, I'm pointing with the arrow, sorry. But that was a girdle buckthorn, it's right next to it. This is a rock wall that was completely covered and, and hidden with buckthorn. Um, some honeysuckle, but predominantly buckthorn. And if you look along the edge of the front where the, um, where the meadow kind of comes up, that again is still buckthorn growing again. And I think a lot of the buckthorn came from birds eating it, rest, uh, resting in the trees, perched and just defecating and created this buckthorn, um, just massive invasion. This is about four years later, I've been cutting this buckthorn every year, usually in August and September to try to get rid of it. Get another picture of that same you can see it's small growth. It's not tall trees anymore, um, but it's so prevalent and it, it takes multi years of cutting and uh, eradicating. You can see it around the base of a pine tree, um, just up in the field. And again, honeysuckle is in with the buckthorn in that other picture. Honeysuckle is another invasive. Um, I've seen this more towards the streams and the ponds, but there is some up in the woods as well. And it's, um, again, like buckthorn, they leaf out very early, they grow very quickly, and they're some of the last plants to drop their leaves. So they really got a start on the natives and they outcompete them. I mean, I've seen this obviously in the, in the picture before by the rock wall where they just, overfill the area and allowed no native plants to grow. Close up of buck, um, um, honeysuckle, you can see its characteristic red berry and, and the woody stem that's hollow and, and white as compared to a native, which I guess is a lot rarer. This is a great resource that I was luckily, excuse the pun, tap into. Ethan Tapper is the Chittenden County Forester. And um, I spoke and, and saw, I spoke with him very often and also watched a lot of his, of his podcasts and webinars that are available on YouTube. Well, Ethan's a great resource. He came and visited and we walked the woods for a couple, what should have been an hour, we ended up walking for three. Um, but very helpful in identifying crop trees, how to release trees, what, what the benefits of um, eradicating the invasive species. And, and taught me that a messy forest is a good forest. <laughs> Buckthorn, again, a creative use of it, a good friend of mine took some of it. It's very red, a unique color combined it with some epoxy and created a beautifully turned um, bowl. And sometimes we wonder whether or not we have too much of a good thing. This was taken a bunch of years ago, uh, but you can look at all the traffic like Steve was talking about. There's so much activity that you see, particularly with snow on the ground. And it looks like uh, many of the deer bedded down for the night right there out by the lawn. Um, but winter is great. You get a chance to track a lot of the animals. But again, you wonder if, is this, because there's not a lot of predators for them, is it too much? 
And we see it particularly uh, come the end of March. The animals literally come out of the woods to eat because they've uh, probably um, uh, have fed on everything that's viable at that point. So we get lots of turkeys, deer um, that will show up. I think we counted 12 one time that were at this feeder. And then we knew it was time to stop feeding. <laughs> Excuse me, Paul, just to do a time check, we have about another, just a couple minutes okay. um, for your Thank slot, you. if that works for you. Thank you. It works great. I think we're down to two slides. Um, again, more deer eating, almost looking like a kangaroo at the bird feeder. And last but not least, they seem to coexist very well. Again, that's a pile of buckthorn out there in the field. Um, and I think that's it. So I will stop sharing. There we go. Great. Thank you. Wow. Th thanks, Paul. What amazing pictures um, you shared here. And if that doesn't inspire you to, to live in Vermont, uh, I don't know what, what would. So thank you. That was, that was really great. Um, so I want to turn it over to Karina Daly, who's uh, BNRC's restoration ecologist, to share some resources with you. Can you guys hear me? We can. I just wanted to share some resources um, with you guys that I work with. I'm the restoration ecologist for VNRC and I work on the dam removal program throughout Vermont. So I happen to be in Rutland today. I'm actually at the Pittsburgh Public Library before um, visiting a dam that I'm removing on Tenny Brook in downtown Rutland. And as a part of that project and um, many other projects, we um, replant the river after we remove the dam with native species. And so just thinking about backyard habitat in downtown Rutland versus um, my backyard in Jericho and wanting to share some resources. And I really appreciate what both Steve and Paul um, were speaking with regard to water and food and shelter. Um, in backyard habitat. And I wanna to add to that, I think canopy structure and diversity are, are really important. Um, and in thinking of that, I wanted to share the National Wildlife Foundation's Native Plant Finder. Um, Doug Ptolemy at a presentation that VNRC held a couple weeks ago, shared that um, website as well. So maybe you are familiar with that. I also use the Go Botany key um, through Native Plus planttrust.org is an excellent resource. And um, that key you know, identifies species that are common in Vermont and New Hampshire. So it's, it definitely covers the region and it's, it's an excellent key um, for, for lay folks. I also wanted to share the link to the Fern, Vermont's um, Native Fern Handbook um, on the Vermont State Park website. And Art Gilman is a good friend of mine and everyone should own a copy of the new flora of Vermont if you want to know exactly the, species, the appropriate species that are in Vermont um, as far as flora goes. And then as far as seed mixes, um, a local seed mix is the best and Vermont Wetland Plant Supply in Orwell, Vermont is somewhere we cook, um, purchase a lot of our seed mixes for uh, restoration projects in Vermont and they have upland seed. So don't be confused. They are a wetland plant supplier, but they also have upland seed mixes. They also have trees and shrubs, all native. Um, most of them are grown on their property in Orwell. Um, they're excellent folks and it's um, very interesting just to go down there and see their operation. So when we can't, we also harvest seeds on site. We often will, you know, if there's native vegetation that we want on um, a restoration site, we can spend a day cutting willows and dogwoods and um, speckled alder and harvesting seeds and spreading them and have had tremendous success with that. So even before ordering seeds from another town in Vermont, you can harvest seeds from your own site and spread them with a lot of success. Um, I also wanted to share the Vermont Invasives website, um, just as far as a reference for invasive species in Vermont, um, the most up-to-date with lots of good management techniques. 
And another resource that I'm sure most of you are familiar with is the Woodlands, Wetlands, and Wildlands book um, that's um, produced by Vermont Fish and Wildlife. And I find that a tremendous research in understanding the natural communities in Vermont and then pairing the underlying bedrock and um, vegetation with that natural community. So if I can, you know, if I'm working with sandy soil, then the vegetation that I'm looking for is going to be very different than if I'm in a calcareous bedrock. Um, location. So thinking about the natural communities that may have existed in your backyard prior to development can help um, identify which plants you might want to plant in that location. And then of course Steve's book, um, the link um, is at the bottom here. I think the link was broken because it was so long, but if you just put in backyard wildlife habitat in Vermont, it pops up. So that's all I have to share. Um, thank you so much, Steve and Paul. Great, thanks, Karina. And we're going to make these resources available on our website as well. So if you didn't catch some of these links, um, then you can follow up and we're going to be adding more content on our website. And then I just wanted to show you where you can find some additional resources on our website. Um, so if you go to vnrc.org and um, you go to about VNRC or let's see, if you go to our work, uh, the Vermont Environmental Report can be found here. You can read, we put these out about twice a year. And then of course, here is the most recent one with a focus on Vermont's backyard biodiversity and wildlife. Bunch of rich articles in here and a feature showcasing some of Steve's work and Paul's photography here. So I encourage you to read this if, uh, if you're interested. And then we've also talked about um, um, the Certified Wildlife Habitat Program, which, which Paul is part of. We have some resources on our website, um, which you can find uh, here under Backyard Habitat. And then that will also direct you to NWF at the bottom, Certified Wildlife Habitat Program at NWF, where you can find more resources. Um, so I encourage you to, to go to BNRC's webpage where you can uh, learn about these programs and how to certify your own backyard habitat. I also just wanted to uh, quickly mention, and Paul, thanks for you know recognizing the value of working with Ethan, your county forester. County foresters are great resources. Um, there's a number of great uh, ecologists throughout the state as well. And so we're going to be creating a page with uh, information about how you can um, essentially communicate with a number of different folks that can help you. I wanted to quickly mention while we're talking about county foresters, the value that they bring that uh, VNRC's annual meeting is going to be held, um, I believe on, uh, well, on the 23rd of, of this month. And you can find information about that. It's going to be a remote uh, annual meeting. And we will be giving an award to Nancy Patch, who is, who is the Franklin County uh, Forester for all of her great work, including uh, promoting smart growth and uh, communities that she's lived in uh, up in northern Vermont um, as part of the Cold Holiday Canada uh, initiative. And uh, again, just another you know, shout out to the important role that, that county foresters play, not only um, in, in managing our, our wonderful landscape, but also working on how to conserve it. So with that, we wanted to segue to your questions. Again, thanks to the, all the presenters here. That was really inspiring. And uh, we want to open it up to your questions now. Colin, I'll let you um, turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, there are already a number of resources that were mentioned. Some of those are in the chat, so check those out. Uh, if you have questions, we have about uh, nine minutes, it looks like, until one. Uh, please drop those in the chat. I saw one earlier about uh, rabbit habitat, um, kind of living in fields and meadows. But uh, either Steve or Paul, if you want to take that one, uh, what are some, some things people can do to support rabbit habitat? I think that as long as you have a brushy area with cover uh, and you're near a source of rabbits, they're going to find you. Uh, they may not show themselves if they've got predators like uh, coyotes. Um, and sometimes it's funny, some animals actually use the coyotes, uh, use our homes to scrape off the coyote pressure. Like there was a study done at UVM where red foxes would come in closer to people's homes 
who had dogs because the coyotes wouldn't come in close. And so the rabbits, you know, uh, they're actually not native. Uh, we have the Eastern cottontail, the native rabbit was the New England cottontail. We haven't found one of those since the 1970s, but they're pretty darn similar. And uh, in the Champlain Valley, you, you could hardly throw a stone without hitting a rabbit somewhere. So it could be that you don't have enough cover or you've got a predator, including you or your neighbor's dog. So that's just some possibilities. Um, they're frankly underfoot at my house. Um, you know, they just kind of blink at me and my dog when I'm walking around a leash. So uh, depending on where you are, it could be different. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question. Um, I knew you were showing uh, some water uh, resources that you can put out to support wildlife habitats. And I was just wondering about um, kind of mosquito breeding. It's so the NRC right now is involved in uh, trying to protect some endangered bats in Southern Vermont against mosquito spraying. Uh, but could you talk a little bit about balancing uh, Having, having water resources and stuff that mosquitoes might, might breed in and also keeping the populations down so we don't have to spray as much to do that? Sure, so you, know, you don't wanna have stagnant water. And if you have a little plant saucer full of water, you can see the larva squiggling around in there and you dump it out and you refill it. You just, it's kind of maintenance, like your bird feeders. I've had people say, I don't have any birds coming to my bird feeder. You go up to it and it's a solid mass with fungus growing in it. it some, some of it just just maintenance. And so, uh, you know, uh, I don't have problems with mosquitoes uh, at my house, even though I have water sources out, but I'm out there dumping the saucers every couple of days and refilling them as much for the algae that grows in it as anything else. So it doesn't take much work. Uh, you know, other things can be sources for mosquitoes too. Uh, and so if you have, you know, um, old tires or something, they can be a source of mosquitoes. And so, you know, the health department, I think, had some guidance on that when we were worried about West Nile and other things. Great. That's good advice. I see Sabina in the chat mentioned uh, these BT mosquito dunkers as well. Um, so... Uh, some good information. Uh, Paul, a question for you. Um, you had mentioned warmer water uh, and noticing some changes around that in wildlife habitat. Uh, is Have you noticed other changes just due to climate change and a warming environment? And you talked a lot about invasives, um, but uh, anything, anything you've noticed or any advice for, for people who are noticing a changing environment in their own yards? Um. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I, we noticed it in the ponds, in addition to the invasives, um, because the water was definitely warmer over the years. You know, we, we had the ponds dug a good 35 years ago. And at that time, the water stayed a lot cooler. Um, I don't think the ponds have come up that much in losing depth. So I don't think that's a factor, but it's just over time. I know here in Richmond, I track degree days per heating season, and we've seen a decline, um, you know, a, a pretty precipitous decline in the last five or six years in heating degree days. And I think that translated into a warmer pond water, which trout don't like. Um, and little by little from the streams, there, there is a little brook that it's attached to, um, other fish have migrated in. Um, where I'm not sure I can actually have trout in the pond any longer. So that was the biggest, um, the biggest sign for me. Um, invasives is another one, definitely. There are some plants that we have growing here that um, we hadn't seen since we first were here 40 years ago. And I think that's a big factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, things are definitely changing. Um, there's one more question. What about uh, small parcels of land? Uh, it's like under an acre with 100 feet of waterfront. Um, I guess what are some things people can do uh, to support wildlife habitat on smaller parcels? Well, I think you can have success depending on what kind of wildlife you're happy with. Uh, 
I watch uh, Gardener's World uh, all the time, and they forever have people in high rises with balconies. And the things that some people have done on that is just amazing. But you're talking about bees and butterflies, maybe a hummingbird. Um, you can also share with your neighbors if they're into it. But even on a small parcel of 0.6 acres is, is probably enough as long as the animals can get to your yard safely. You know, if you're surrounded by a concrete jungle, it becomes more difficult. But birds can fly in and insects can fly in, bats can fly in. Um, and it's a matter of being secure. Uh, so if, if your neighbor's cats camped out in your backyard, that's a problem. I mean, frankly, cats do a lot of damage. It's just what they do. I mean, a dog off leash can also scare wildlife because it's, it's a predator. Wildlife recognize it as a predator until they realize how stupid it is and it's on a leash and it's never gonna get close to them. Rabbits actually just turn their backs on my dog. And she's not a small dog and she'd really love to chase them, but she's just never allowed and the rabbits have learned that. So, um, you know, you, ha you have to just try some things. If you have waterfront, just having some cover that goes right down to the water. Oftentimes people will have water uh, wildlife ponds, they'll call them wildlife ponds and they'll mow the entire perimeter. And I was noticing in Paul's slides how he has really good cover, at least on portions of it. So that's really important. Hey, Steve, can I add to that too? Um, what we're trying to do is also reduce what we do mow, although I keep it to an hour on a ride-on mower, I'm still spewing out nauseous fumes <laughs> into the air. So we, we, little by little, we're trying to grow more native plants as we replace the invasives. And that's one of the tenets you know, of this program, I think, is to convert a lot of the lawn that we mow today back to a more natural habitat. The other thing we also do is keep fields unmowed and untouched. Um, until the very, very, almost November. And then if I want to create paths and stuff, I'll go and do it then. That's great advice. Um, I'm seeing we are bumping right up against one o'clock here uh, and I want to let people go on time. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that VNRC is a member supported organization. I'm going to drop a link in the chat here. Uh, member support helps us hold these webinars and do all the other work that we do. Um, so thank you to all the members who are on here. If you haven't joined yet, uh, please check that out and consider it. Uh, and thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, this is very informative. I learned a lot. I was taking notes the whole time. Uh, so we will compile the resources and send around the recording uh, and put this up on our website afterwards uh, so you don't have to miss anything you didn't get to jot down. And if you have any questions, you could email them to me. I'll put my uh, email in the chat too and we can follow up with our presenters to get some information. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you at the annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It was great.